Hi everybody, let's in this video understand the key differences between commercial banks and investment banks, something I'm sure interests loads of you out there. Well, let's look at commercial banks uh, first. Very simple functions that commercial banks have, like NatWest in the UK, Lloyds, TSB, these are all classic examples of commercial banks. Their functions are so simple, to accept savings as we've learned from those that have got excess cash, to then lend out to borrowers, so to convert those savings into loans and to lend out, in that sense to act as financial intermediaries, right? So the idea is give a, a smaller rate of return on savings compared to the interest rate charged to borrowers and that way they can make profit. That's their very simple business model, acting as financial intermediaries, bringing together savers with borrowers, right? Uh, but also to allow payments from one agent to another, so you know you can divert funds from your bank account to businesses, for example, if you want to uh, pay for goods and services. That's a very important function that uh, commercial banks have as well. They also offer advice, insurance advice, financial advice. Um, that is another key function that commercial banks have. But you see, very simple, not hugely profitable, the commercial banking side. What's much more profitable is what investment banks do. Let's understand that. What investment banks get up to is much more lucrative, much more profitable, much more exciting. Uh, pure investment banks out there, for example, Goldman Sachs, for example, JP Morgan, it's rare to see pure investment banks these days. You often see a mix between investment banking side and the commercial banking side. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later with respect to systemic risk. But one key function of investment banks is proprietary trading, prop trading. And this is taking any excess capital that investment banks are sitting on and investing it, trying to get a better rate of return. Maybe buying shares, buying bonds, buying derivatives, any kind of financial assets that investment bankers think is going to generate a better rate of return for the investment bank. So taking profits and trying to make more profits out of them, basically. Very high profile, very lucrative, very, very profitable. Uh, and therefore, if you work in that part of an investment bank, boy, you can be making big, big, big money. Market making, this is essentially ensuring that markets can exist. So you know, for example, if you go, if you want a second-hand car, if you go to a second-hand car dealership, you know you can get a car from there. Similarly, if you want to sell your car, you know you can go to a second-hand car dealership and they are going to buy your car up, right? It is a place where the market exists. The same thing can be said of investment banks. They're a place where uh, bonds, shares can be bought and sold on behalf of lenders and borrowers. It's a place where you know if you want to lend money, you can buy bonds from investment banks, you can buy shares from there and other financial products from there. And if you want to borrow, you know that you can go and issue bonds, for example, through an investment bank, shares through an investment bank. So in that sense, they create a market. You always know in an investment bank there are going to be shares to buy, there are going to be bonds to buy. In that sense, they're a market maker. We then look at some advisory roles. Uh, mergers and acquisition. acquisitions is a key advisory role that investment banks have. So if you have a company that's looking to take over or to merge with another company, they might go through an investment bank for advice, basically. What kind of advice? Well, advice on when to go through that merger or that takeover. How to structure that deal, if it's a cash buy, if it's a share buy, whatever it might be. Due diligence to make sure that everything is, is A-OK -okay with the firm that a predator or a, uh, the, the first firm is looking to take over. Is everything OK with that takeover firm? Um, there are no kind of cobwebs or hidden secrets with that firm. To make sure that all the paperwork is done and meets whatever the regulators want, that's important. And to make sure that it goes out into the media in a very successful way, in a positive way as well. So investment banks can give very important advice when it comes to mergers and acquisitions, uh, charging a big fee in the process. But also when it comes to new issues, so if companies want to issue bonds to raise finance or issue shares, to raise finance, they can go to an investment bank to gain help. Investment banks can actually put them into contact with people that are looking to buy these bonds and buy these shares. Investment banks can publicize them. Investment banks can write them up for them and issue them for them. So important roles, you know, when it comes to publicity, they can literally make brochures and, and sell these bonds and sell these shares on behalf of the issuers, which is very important when these guys want to raise finance. They can also get in, involved in something called underwriting. So nobody wants to buy the new issues of shares or bonds that companies are offering. Investment banks can buy them all up on behalf of that company and then charge a percentage fee on top of whatever that value is, making huge sums of money. That's known as underwriting. 
So these are some of the core functions of investment banks. I've left a couple out because they are very technical, you don't need to know them. You just need to know these core functions. Nowadays you don't really see pure commercial banks necessarily and pure investment banks necessarily. Yes, there are one or two examples. What you tend to see more of are banks like HSBC and Barclays that will engage in both kinds of activities. They'll have a commercial bank side or a retail side and they'll also have an investment bank side. Now that's important for you to know because then the risk of systemic risk is much greater whereby failures on one side, especially the investment bank side, can bring down the other side and therefore the risk of a bank failure is much higher. And as we know, as so many banks are interconnected, you know, they've got liabilities and assets that other banks may have. Um, the risk of one side failing, bringing down the other, could then bring down the entire financial system. That's the idea of systemic risk. So the more you merge these two activities together in one bank, the greater risk there is of the bank failing. And because all banks now are interconnected in some way, the risk of, therefore, the whole financial system coming down, i.e., what happened in 2008, is much greater. That's why we say that merging these two sides together increases the risk of systemic risk in the financial system, where the whole financial system can come down. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Hopefully you found that very interesting and you understand it now. I'll see you all in the next video.